This is the third session of the Federalist Papers Book Club. As a reminder, I want to begin by putting up the screen on the slide that shows where you can get all of the slides from the previous sessions and from this session as well. In addition, I want to mention that although we don't have any more judges tonight, we'll have some comments from some of our students. We have a core of students who form the inner part of the book club, and they have sent in some questions, some comments, and I'll put those up on the screen. But we invite others who are in the audience to send in your questions or comments down to the um, email that you can see right here on the screen that uh, Brahm has just put up. So tonight, I want to do three things. One, I want to link what we've been doing in the past two classes and move into this and show how they relate. That's one. Two, there's a real barrier for Americans today to understand what was happening in, in the time and in terms of what the Federalist is saying. Well, first of all, it's very good, but difficult writing, that's one thing, in a language that we're not familiar with. But there's something more the founders could understand and talked in terms of what had happened in ancient Greece and Rome. And yet we find it much more difficult to understand what happened 200 years ago. But there's a reason for that. And that's what we'll talk about in part. And then we'll get into the argument about what the Federalists were for. And so I'll briefly go through the outline of the whole argument of the book, just very briefly. And then we'll go in to the outline and the comments, the text of Federalist Number 10 itself, because it is the essay that's most read around the world. And it is read around the world. I remember after the fall of the Soviet Union and the other countries in Eastern Europe, there was a, a quip in Newsweek that said, James Madison, call your desk because of all the requests to USIA, now part of the State Department, in Eastern Europe, they wanted to read the Federalist. And I know because I and others went over to then Czechoslovakia to hold seminars with those who had led the Velvet Revolution. And quite interestingly, <laughs> many of the concerns that they had <laughs> echoed the concerns of the Anti-Federalists. We'll talk about that more as we go along. But in any event, um, in terms of the connection to the last time, we had Judge Thapar and then Judge Oldham. Judge Thapar and Oldham gave us two things. They gave us what they were against, the Anti-Federalists. That was primarily Justice Judge Thapar, hopefully soon, someday, Justice. And Judge Oldham, what the actual anti federalist argument was for. And you have to keep that slide, if you can, in mind. But there's one particular slide that I want to go to, and that is, will you put it up, Brown? This is, I shared it last time, but this is really important. I'm just reading the outline, the uh, highlighted part. The Federalist and the anti federalist disagreements were not based on different premises about the nature of man or the ends of political life. They were not the deep cleavages of contending regimes. What it is important to understand today is that's not, no longer true. I mentioned it briefly in the last session. We have a different understanding on the part of many people of human nature. And we'll talk about that. Human nature, if you don't have that same understanding, you're going to have these cleavages in the regime. So when I talk about the, the um, progressives, that's what I'm talking about, but it takes some explanation. So we're gonna begin by talking about Woodrow Wilson. Slide, Brown. Okay, Woodrow Wilson, who just got canceled at the Woodrow Wilson School of International Law at Princeton is, deserving of being canceled because he actually is the originator of what turns out to be cancel culture. 
Why? Because Woodrow Wilson was the leader of the, the intellectual leader and even the political leader of the progressive movement. Now, the progressive movement had many aspects to it, and not everybody in the progressive movement thought the same thing. We'll talk about that uh, somewhat. But I want to go, first of all, to his famous book on congressional government. This is in, I think, 1884. It was in the 1880s. That's when progressivism really gets going. So what, what's ironic, and this is really important, the first sentence, the very men who had resisted with might and main the adoption of the Constitution, namely the anti-federalists, became, under the new division of parties, its champions as sticklers for a strict, a rigid, and literal construction. That's Jeffersonianism. Okay, so the anti-federalists didn't leave. They didn't go to Canada. They didn't go back to England. They stayed here. Jefferson, who supported the Constitution, becomes their leader. He takes over much of their viewpoint. He already had the same viewpoint in many things. But Jefferson was a supporter of the Constitution. Moreover, Jefferson required the reading of the Federalist at the University of Virginia. But of course, he wanted the right kind of professors teaching it. He was no fool. Anyway, but here's what's really interesting down the highlighted part. The fact that opposition to the Constitution as a constitution and even hostile critiques of its provisions ceased almost immediately upon its adoption. And not only ceased, but gave place to an undiscriminating and almost blind worship of its principles and of that delicate dual system of sovereignty. He can't believe it, <laughs> okay? So in the next slide, we're going to talk about or quote. Now, what he's saying, it is interesting to note that we, namely Wilson, of the present generation are in the first season of free, outspoken, and unrestrained constitutional criticism. Yes, he's the originator. It's the first season. It's the first season. We're still in that season. It hasn't stopped. That's where the cleavage is. Down further in the highlighting, he refers to Europe, the first to think of remodeling administrative machinery. This is where the administrative state comes in. The administrative machinery of the federal government. It rests not just on a particular constitutional deviation. It is a deliberate philosophic change and it is a real rejection of the Constitution and a forcing, forcing, forcing new forms of responsibility upon Congress. Well, it turns out that under the administrative state, Congress has new responsibility only in the sense of spending more money because what they do is less to actually read legislation. The American people were open to this dirty secret when it came to Obamacare, when Nancy Pelosi said, well, we've got to pass it first to know what's in it. The reality is members of Congress do not read the legislation. After all, if it's 2000 pages, how can they do it with everything else? I once asked a conservative senator's chief of staff, I said, is your boss read all the legislation? He said, no, he can't, but we make sure that somebody in the office reads everything collectively. Well, that's great, but these are people often fresh out of law school who don't know what they're reading, frankly. So Congress and the notion of self-government actually goes away in large part with the administrative state. And the idea of congressional government is what he first focuses on, but then later he shifts to presidential government, which we'll see in his later book on constitutional government in the United States. The government of the United States was constructed upon the Whig theory of political dynamics, which was a sort of unconscious copy of the Newtonian theory of the universe. In our day, whenever we discuss the structure or development of anything, 
whether in nature or in society, we consciously follow Mr. Darwin. But before Mr. Darwin, they followed Newton. That's the fundamental cleavage. Now, I'm not talking about Darwin's theory in terms of physical, biological evolution. That's to one side. What he is saying here is that we're applying Darwinism to everything. And when you apply it to human nature, what you get is an evolving nature. There is no constant human nature. It is evolving. We don't know what it will be tomorrow. So it may seem odd that certain people who 10, 15 years ago had certain views about gender, that all of a sudden they could flip almost overnight because they've been told that there is a different way of looking at things. Where do they get that idea? Certainly not from common people. Where was Wilson getting his ideas? He was educated largely in Germany. Now, you probably know that Wilson has been outed as a racist and a eugenicist, as were the Nazis. Now, the Nazis came along later. I'm not saying he was a Nazi. He was not. It is the intellectual climate that destroyed the intellectual base of morality in Germany that made it possible for the Nazi regime. Progressivism, as properly understood, and I'll go into that more, has eroded the moral base in this country. I'm not talking strictly religious at all. I'm talking moral base. Let's continue. The trouble with, no, back, Brom, I'm not done reading this. The trouble with the theory is that government is not a machine. No, government's not a machine by itself. It has human beings. But the big difference is that the founders believed, both Federalists and Anti-Federalists, in an understanding of human nature that was driven by the passions in large part, and that if you wanted to get good government, you had to restrain the passions. That goes out the window for many because we don't know what human nature is. And if we're gonna restrain it, we are going to prevent it from evolving to what it will be in the future. It falls not under the theory of the universe, but under the theory of organic life. It is accountable to Darwin, not to Newton. Then I'll just read the last sentence. No living thing can have the organic offset against each other as checks and live. That is the origin of the quote, living evolving constitution. It's not just a matter of a written document. It is a matter of a viewpoint on human nature. That is the radical divide that is between us who follow the founders and those who reject the founders. And of course, there are many people who try to straddle between these two things. Okay, Brian, next slide, please. So what happened? What happened is there's a divide in large part prompted, but not completely prompted by the Civil War. In law school, you know, we often talk about how the 14th Amendment changed things after the Civil War. It did in many ways, many good ways. And I often add the 17th Amendment. That's really important because as I've said, the states were part of the national government until the 17th Amendment. Yes, states still have two senators, but they are not accountable to the state as sovereign. They are accountable to the people as people, voters in the state, just the way members of the House are. And that was a radical change. But Justice uh, Judge Thapari said to me, well, I'm not gonna let you get away there, that it's just all the 17th Amendment. That's right, it wasn't. It's what's driving the 17th Amendment. What happens after the Civil War is the rise of many isms or ideologies. Anything that's an ism is a reduction ism. And there are many of them and they are often overlapping and political scientists and others can debate what particular isms cover and don't cover. But it's clear that after the Civil War, there was the rise of quote, positivism. 
that's very different from the framing generation. They talked in terms of moral science. Law was still, quote, a moral science at the time of the founding. Social Darwinism, I've already referred to with Wilson. Progressivism also with Wilson. Pragmatism, you often hear that term. We'll talk in a minute about um, Justice Holmes and pragmatism was often um, a label pinned on him. Other people disagree with that label and give other labels to him. But the one thing that undergirds most of these ideologies is moral relativism. Next slide, bro. If you wanna really understand what happened in this country in terms of constitutional law, I always pit the two Harvard law professors back then who got onto the US Supreme Court. This is the divide between the founding generation and progressivism. The founders constitution versus the living constitution. There is no better representative of the founding constitution than Justice Joseph Story, even though he was not literally a founder because he came along later, but he was the brains along with Marshall, the Marshall Court. But more than that, he is the second professor at Harvard, and he is the one who is heavily influential in causing Harvard to be a national law school. Indeed, what Story did in his treatises, he had five treatises, including the one on constitutional law, in which he explained in treatise form the law of particular areas. But the interesting thing about his treatise on constitutional law, as his son explained, was that he had the aim to include in the treatise three things, the text of the Constitution, the Federalist Papers, and the decisions of the Marshall Court. They were all in accord. That was the whole point. Now, in large part, that story is also in part the explanation for that worship of the Constitution that Wilson referred to in a less than complimentary way. Because Story and others created what were called constitutional catechisms. It's not only the Catholic Church that has a catechism, at least at that time, certain Protestant denominations did. And students, beginning in the third grade, and then at two other points in their K-12 education, they went over at in greater depth the Constitution. And people, students, memorized the Constitution. That was the source of the reverence for the Constitution. All of that really changes as a result of the Civil War because of the shock on the system. But if you, you, if you con contrast these two people, for instance, Story said in his famous Swift versus Tyson decision, opinions of courts are not law. That was heresy as far as Holmes was concerned. And Holmes was vindicated in Erie Railroad where Brandeis said law is, includes the decisions, the opinions of courts. So you, you can look at those two and you realize the divide. Unfortunately for many conservatives, they identify with Holmes without understanding that Holmes gives rise to everything else. Holmes may have been a, a uh, more restrained living constitutionalist, but basically he cut the guts out from under the constitution. Well, how can I say that? Well, he was on the faculty at Harvard under Langdell. Dean Langdell's purpose was to create a law curriculum that mirrored biology and that we would use cases, and I'm not against the case method, don't get me wrong. We would use cases as, as examples and we would go to the library, like you'd go to the laboratory. There was this whole attempt to imitate what we call often the hard sciences. Basically, it drove the humanities and therefore moral reasoning out of our understanding of law. From Holmes, as many would say, we get legal realism, which is perfectly anti-intellectual. There is nothing behind it other than the notion that 
what the judge decides happens to be the law. That's not the rule of law in any serious sense. Next slide, Brown. So I want to talk a little bit more about progressivism because it's it runs across, at, at least at the time, it runs across the, both Republican and Democratic parties, but the more prominent uh, progressives were actually Republicans. So Teddy Roosevelt, famous for being a, um, a progressive, he of course is the one who appointed Holmes to the Supreme Court. And after Holmes's dissent in the antitrust case, Northern Securities, he, fe he fell out with Holmes and he didn't uh, have any high regard for him after that. But Roosevelt um, was followed by uh, Howard Taft. And Taft was elected president because of Roosevelt's support. And they soon fell out. And then the election of 1912, you had three presidential candidates, you may remember, that when Roosevelt did not get back the nomination, but it continued with Taft, that you had Taft versus Woodrow Wilson, but you also had Teddy Roosevelt in there. And the combined vote of Roosevelt and Taft was way more than that the Wilson got, but Wilson was elected. So Wilson was able then to take his theories into the government itself. And we're in an age of a lot of progressive legislation, but it predated, the progressive legislation predated Wilson. All of this predates FDR. This is building up for a long time. Howard Taft, for whom Justice Scalia had great regard, um, even though he was a progressive in one sense, his party was as progressive Republican. Holmes was Republican. Roosevelt was progressive Republican. We have all these progressives. And today, Republicans don't identify as progressive, but many of them actually still are progressives. I would say that when people refer to, quote, establishment Republicans or rhino Republicans, what you're talking about are descendants, basically, of progressive Republicans. That's what it is. Okay, let's go to the next slide, Bob. So, what I want to do now, as I said, is outline, first of all, the Federalists. Now, here's an interesting thing that very few of you will be aware of, even if you've gone to law school, unless you've studied civil law. The outline of the Federalist is actually in two parts. I know the outline given at the end of essay number one divides it into a series of parts, as does the introduction, if you're using the Liberty Fund edition. But in a code, a criminal code, as we had in Louisiana and as the model penal code, they follow the European approach. The European approach is to have a general part where you have principles and doctrines, and then you have the specific part. So in criminal law, you'd have, in the general part, you'd have statements about the doctrine or principles accessories, mens rea, um, accessory after the fact, attempt, all of these things. They're general, meaning they apply to all the, all the particular crimes. And then the specific part, you'd have murder, rape, robbery, et cetera. So the point is that the, the specific part should follow from the general part. That's not the way American lawyers generally think. The first book that Justice Scalia ever published was in, at Princeton, and it was, um, oh, what was it called? I knew it a minute ago. Um, but in it, he, he said, uh, the US is a, a codified system. Now, he didn't really have it right about codification. His point was, we're not a common law system really anymore because statutes and the constitution have taken over. But our statutes are not as well formed and coherent as generally is the case in a civil law. The point here is that the general part, the part that I'm spending most of the time on is from essay one to 51. Yes, we're gonna cover the specific part as well, but in the specific part, you're repeating 
or applying what you've learned in the general part. So let's go on to look briefly at the outline of the Federalist and we'll next slide, Bob. Okay, so I'm gonna go over this a little bit because it deals with Federalist 10 and then the other couple of slides I will go over very quickly. So the problem with Republicanism is that liberty produces factions which then threaten liberty. That's what Federalist 10 is all about. Factions are rooted in the passions inherent in human nature. We'll talk more about that. The solution, controlling the effects, not the cause, causes of factions. The means to the end of controlling the effects of factions. You can disperse political powers by multiplying factions or by spreading out the population and structuring government. So quickly on the next two slides, then we do go to structure. This becomes the explanation still in the general part of what we're gonna see in the specific part, federalism. Yes, that's all we have to say about it right now. Next slide. Separation of powers, okay? And the following slide. So what we're gonna see in Federalist 51, it pulls together everything in the general part and how the various parts that look confusing when you only are focused on one, they actually fit together. Some a few years ago in a federalism separation of powers subcommittee or, or planning group that we have at the Federalist Society, we we're on the, the committee call and um, a state attorney general said, uh, can we stop talking about separation of powers and talk about federalism? I had to bite my tongue because almost all federalism questions are questions of separation of powers. Why? Well, just think about McCullough. McCullough we think of as, as a federalism case. Why? Because the federal statute prevailed. But the state was making a federalism, a separation of powers issue. They were claiming the act of Congress was unconstitutional and wanted the court to say so. Had the state won, that would then have been listed as a separation of powers case. So it is wrong to understand them separately. It is a complex system in which truly American federalism consists both of federalism in the sense of the states and the relationship between the federal government and the states, but also the separation of powers, both at the federal level and at the state level. Okay, next up, Federalist 10 in human nature. So first up, what I'm gonna do is just show you the slide. I'm not gonna read it all because what we're gonna do is go through them all with selections that fit under the heading. But this is a slide that you may wanna get. So we'll go to then the first slide, or the first uh, category. So the advantages of a well-constructed union it con controls the violence of factions. Now, both the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists agreed that factions were a problem. The, their solutions, however, are very different. Basically, what the Anti-Federalists said is that you've got to get people in a homogeneous population so their interests are all the same, and therefore you won't have factions. Well, in my view, that's rather naive. Anybody who has lived in a family with more than two children, or at least more than one, will know that there are factions within a family even where it shouldn't even exist. And if you get any kind of expansion beyond the family, you are guaranteed to have factions. We'll come back to that as to what then is the solution to the problem. So complaints are everywhere heard from our most considerate and virtuous citizens, equally the friends of public and private faith and of public and personal liberty that our governments are too unstable. I ask you, if you are observing the United States from abroad today, would you say that we are as stable as we used to be? Or are we in danger of actually coming to the point that the framers saved us for many years. 
that the public good is disregarded in the conflict of rival parties. Why is it that there is such division in Washington? Why is it that they can't compromise? I go back to ideology. Ideology is the overlay that didn't exist in the 18th century. And that measures are too often decided, not according to the rules of justice and the rights of the minor party, but by the superior force of an interested and overbearing majority. Remember that. <laughs> Human nature hasn't changed. We're dealing today with the same problems they were dealing with, but worse, we have ideologies that complicate matters. Next slide, Ralph. Well, by a faction, I understand a number of citizens whether amounting to a majority or a minority of the whole, who are united and actuated by some common impulse of passion or of interest adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. Okay, all of you in the audience, are any of you, are all of you members of factions? What do you think? Do you work for a corporation? Do you member a labor union? Are you a teacher? Are you a fireman? Are you a policeman? Are you a college professor? Are you a doctor? Do they all have their own interests? Yes. Now, the problem with this definition is it is natural that there will be different interests and there will be passions. The question is adverse to the rights of other citizens or the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. Ah, that's a very important thing. Again, today, are both sides possibly trying to say that the other side is acting in a way that's adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community? I suggest to you to examine it. I'm not saying it's true or it isn't true, but I know this, that people on both sides try to paint the other side that way. Maybe it's legitimate, maybe it's right. I'm not saying, I'm just saying, pay attention to this. Next, possible methods of controlling factions. Well, as I already read, you can remove the causes of faction, the other by controlling its effects. And then there are two ways of removing the causes, the one, by destroying the liberty which is essential to its existence. The other, by giving to every citizen the same opinions, the same passions, and the same interests. Wait a minute, isn't that what the Anti-Federalists wanted in a homogeneous republic? Now, it is possible to some extent in a homogeneous racial, ethnic, religious society. So you take China, 95%, they're same ethnicity. Germany tried to make it homogeneous. Japan until just recently had very, very strict and still now moderately strict immigration. They didn't want any intermarriage, interrelationship to spoil or change the homogeneity. I'm not criticizing that in one sense. There is a natural sense in which people gravitate, quote, to their own. But from the beginning in the Constitutional Convention, and James Wilson makes this point, if you want to attract the best and the brightest in the world, we have to make sure that as citizens, they can get the same rights and privileges as everybody else. There's no advantage to people who came first. Now, you may know that if you go to some other countries, for instance, you cannot buy oceanfront property. Can't do it. Now there are legal ways around it, but legally you can't do it. We don't have that limitation. We have some limitations that are really national security things in terms of, and I wish we had more stringent review of this, but in terms of control of media, in terms of control of, of corporations that relate to national security, that's a different matter. 
But otherwise, we generally allow people from wherever they are to come here and to own property and to benefit us and benefit themselves. Next one. So it could never be more truly said of the first remedy that it is worse than the disease. Factions are bad, but suppressing liberty is worse. Liberty is to faction what air is to fire. An ailment without which it, uh, it instantly expires. The second expedient is impracticable as the first would be unwise. As long as the reason of man continues fallible, and he is at liberty to exercise it, different opinions will be formed. What's going on in this country right now with the major social media is uh, suppressing exactly what this country was founded on. There's no doubt about it. They're attempting to suppress different opinions that they don't agree with. This is totally un-American. It is a very serious threat to our country, and I hope people realize it. This is the grounding of everything else. Federalist 10 explains the ground on which the structure is built. Next. The latent causes of faction are thus sown in the nature of man. All of the founders, Federalist and Anti-Federalist, believe that. Ah, many people today don't believe that. Many academics don't believe that and have taught many students quite the opposite. Now, it's often attributed to Rousseau, although Professor Nelson Lund disagrees with this, but I'll use the conventional notion that Rousseau is responsible for many of the evils in the world that human beings have, you know, everything should get rid of their chains because the chains are still on us. And what are the chains? Civilization. And that human beings are naturally good if we'd only throw off these restraints. Now, the baby boomer generation, either directly or indirectly, experienced this in Woodstock in 1968. That love fest was what we would call hey, the notion that the noble savage is better than the civilized person. That there's where the true goodness is. And if we would only get rid of these restraints, imposed by civilization, our true good nature would come out. That is so radically different from the founding generation that it is the source of a chasm. You can't deal across that divide in any sensible way. So he goes on to say, different opinions concerning religion, concerning government, and many other points, as well as speculation as a practice. We're always going to have that, and that's fine. And we've had it for over two centuries. But the ideological divide is changing the debate. An attachment to different leaders, especially in the South, is much less ideological. It's more about different personalities. Ambitiously contending for preeminence and power or to persons of other descriptions whose fortunes have been interesting to the human passions have in turn divided mankind into parties. We're going to get some observations a little bit from the, our students about parties, but no parties. He's not necessarily referring to formal parties, but he's talking about factions, and factions will be the basis for parties. We will claim them with mutual animosity and render them much more disposed to vex and oppress each other than to cooperate for their common good. I referred before to being in the Czech Republic discussing the Federalist Papers with members of the Velvet Revolution. And um, they were in different parties at that point. They were united against a common enemy. Once the common enemy was gone, they found out, well, guess what? We don't agree on everything. I want to do it this way. You want to do it that way. And that is the natural thing. One of the things that dictatorships have to do is to have an external enemy. Because as long as there's an external enemy to unite the people against, you have them united. Some people after 9-11 noted 
that there was a great deal of unity in the United States, but that over a period of time it dissipated. And they said, well, they longed for that unity again. Yes, we need unity at times of crisis, but we don't want to always live in crisis. And that's what you get when you live in a dictatorial regime where people are in crisis and either trying to avoid the power of the tyrant or trying to overthrow and or overthrow the tyrant. Next. So, but the most common and durable source of factions has been the various and unequal distribution of property. Well, does that mean that he is for socialism? No, but we'll cover that as we get to the end. Those who hold and those who are without property have ever formed the distinct interests in society. Those who are creditors and those who are debtors fall under a like discrimination, a landed interest, a manufacturing interest, the landed and the manufacturing interests were at odds, not only in this country, but in England. They represented different groups. Manufacturing interests and mercantile interests would have been closer. A moneyed interest, yes, with many lesser interests grow up of necessity in civilized nations and divide them into different classes actuated by different sentiments and views. Now, one of the things that people who've gone to law school don't necessarily realize, but I wanna give the pitch here for why we ought not to get rid of diversity jurisdiction as many judges and academics wanna do. Diversity of jurisdiction is what brought us together and which was modeled on an international forum notion that is the confederation before us was an international forum, but it didn't have courts. What's key about this is how do you get those who have money, which at the time they were in the Eastern seaboard cities, how do you get them to invest out in the boondocks as much of America was at the time? You have to protect them through courts. I worked for, with USAID for a number of years and we try to get this message across to other countries saying, look, you want foreign investment but you've got corrupt courts. Corrupt courts are not just a matter of your local concern. It's a matter or not, it's a matter of whether foreign businesses are willing to come in and invest in your country because they've got to know that there is the ability to get treated fairly under the rule of law and to have their property protected. That's what we were doing from the beginning. That in large part is why we didn't turn out to be a third world banana republic because we had an enforced the rule of law quite clearly through a system of federal courts. Next slide. Okay, so no man is allowed to be a judge in his own cause. All lawyers understand that, ordinary people understand that. But then with equal, nay with greater reason, a body of men are unfit to be both judges and parties at the same time. Yet what are many of the most important acts of legislation, but so many judicial determinations. Look, you've got this irony. On the one hand, members of Congress are supposed to represent their constituents. Their constituents are their interests. The problem is, if they're representing their interests, how can they be fair? The key to what we did under the Federalist notion was to figure out and force self-interested people to do the right thing by having to compromise in order to get anything in their own interest. This they picked up from Mansfield in, in England. There's this notion, it's in the book called The Fable of the Beast, about how you get people to cooperate and pursue their both their own self-interest and the interest of the whole of the common good at the same time. Next slide. Justice ought to hold the balance between them. That's the end, that's what they want. But well, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with human beings, human nature, flawed human nature, people who are motivated in large part by self-interest. Self-interest isn't all bad at all. Self-interest is necessary so the government doesn't support them. We want people to support themselves and their families. But in families, you normally have more than just self-interest. You have 
the interest of the whole, the family. It is in vain to say that enlightened statements, statesmen will be able to adjust these clashing interests. Well, you ought to tell that to most of the law professors in the country. In so many classes in this country, in law schools, students are propagandized that the role of a judge is to balance the interest. That's nonsense. Balancing of interest is what legislatures do. Judges are supposed to apply the law that the legislature came up with, which was a balance of interest, not rebalance the interest. That's what they're doing. And render all subservient to the public good. The inference to which we are brought is that the causes of faction cannot be removed and that the relief is only to be sought in the means of controlling its effects. Now, there are people who can remove the causes of faction. They're called priests, ministers, rabbis, imams. That's their job. That's the job of the soul. The soul is not the job of the government. I'm not saying the government should go against what religion does. No, it should respect what it does, but understand it has a different job. To respect that area is not their area. So we got to control the effects. Now, there are many people in this country still who believe that we can control the factions. And this began before social media trying to control opinions that they don't like. How many times have you heard from people, politics would be fine if only we got the money out of it? What is it? The notion is that the source of corruption is the money. Well, it could be, and we have laws against bribery. And Congress can make, within the limits of the First Amendment, can make different laws regarding elections. Okay, those are up to human beings. But it's not, that is where you control the effects. If you have a properly structured Congress and executive branch. Next slide. The inferences we have brought is that the causes of faction cannot be removed. Wait a minute. Next slide. Now, first, before this slide, he says, if, if the, if the uh, faction is a minority, the majority will take care of them. If there's one thing that, that, that Madison didn't figure on was the notion that you would have alliances of minorities. So what does the left do? They're constantly creating new minorities, but they're all united. And is it possible then that what you get is a united majority faction based on ideology? I don't know that they're there yet, but certainly the factions of in the middle and on the right are not nearly as united as they are on the left. When a majority is included in a faction, the form of popular government, on the other hand, enables it to sacrifice to its ruling passion or interest, both the public good and the rights of other citizens. You may remember in, if you watched the video that I asked you to watch before this all started of Justice Scalia, he refers to the fact that it is very easy for any minority group to gum up the works in Congress, throw a monkey wrench in, he said, to any piece of legislation. That's by design. That's how minorities are protected, by being able to slow down and often stop the legislative process until they get a compromise that accommodates their needs. That's designed into the system. Now, the progressives will say, and unfortunately many Americans will say, that's gridlock. There are two different types of gridlock. One is the gridlock that naturally occurs as designed in the Congress and explained in the Federalists. The other is the gridlock that occurs in the administrative state. Next slide. So by what means is this object attainable? Evidently by one of two only. Either the existence of the same passion or interest in a majority at the same time must be prevented. 
That was possible before modern communication. Once you get radio, television, cable, the internet, we now have all kinds of factions assembling through communication. That is one of the areas in which technology has made the solution that then follows not as viable as it once was. Or the majority having such coexistent passion or interest must be rendered by their number and local situation unable to concert and carry into effect schemes of oppression. What's he talking about? The large republic was designed to spread people across the country. Spread them out. Don't concentrate them in one place where they'll have too much communication. And by the number and local situation in big cities, which came along much later, what is it that breaks up factions but includes factions themselves? We'll be talking about it more in the next session. That's commerce. Commerce is designed both to create new factions and to suppress in a certain way existing factions. Next slide. So control of faction is not possible in a pure democracy. Okay. Now, there are those people, even on the right, who want our country to become more democratic. And often the knock on the Federalists is they were anti-democracy. Absolutely, they are anti-pure democracy. And even the anti-fellows realized it wasn't feasible. And by pure democracy, he means a society consider, consisting of a small number of citizens who assemble and administer the government in person. Fine, you can do that in a small town. And if you don't like it, the way they're governing it, you can leave or get elected. You can do one or the other. Small enough that you can do something about it can admit of no cure for the mischiefs of factions. A common passion or interest will, in almost every case, be felt by a majority. If you've been to Mardi Gras, you'll know what I'm talking about. When I first went to Mardi Gras, I thought, these idiots jumping up and down for beads, you know, what, what are they doing? And then not only did I do it, but a general was out there doing it and stomping on people's hands in order to get the beads. The fever of the mob, and that was relatively peaceful mob, it's very contagious. They knew what they were talking about. A common passion or interest will, in almost every case, be felt by a majority of the whole. A communication and a concept results from the form of government itself. And there is nothing to check the inducements to sacrifice the weaker party or an obnoxious individual. Think about what happens to a lot of individuals on social media these days when they get attacked. What is it? It's in a mob attacking them. And some of the injury doesn't have to be physical injury. There are a lot of big ways to injure people. The whole idea of growing up where they stay, kids used to say, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's not true. Words can do a lot of damage. Next slide. Control of factions, not possible in pure, only in, in a representative republic. Theoretic politicians. The Federalist is always knocking theoretic politicians, even though the Federalist is considered one of the greatest works of political theory of all time, who have patronized the species of government, have erroneously supposed that by reducing mankind to a perfect equality in their political rights, they would at the same time be per perfectly equalized and assimilated in their possessions, their opinions, and their passions. He's talking about the anti-federalists, and that was carried over to the agrarian view under Jefferson. But he's also very prescient about what is happening today. Equality has changed from equal protection under the law, that's what the 14th Amendment actually provides, to a notion of equality. And anybody who has studied political theory knows how much you can drive into that term and the different views on equality. Is it equality of opportunity? Is it equality of result? The United States have been very good at developing equality of opportunity. Why? 
because as Madison said at the beginning of this, there tends to be a breakdown of classes based on economic status. But they knew as well as Aristotle knew, a stable republic had to have a large middle class. Now, as many people both right and left have pointed out, during the pandemic, the wealthy is getting extremely wealthy and that people at the lower end, service jobs, essential workers, they are having a hard time of it. We are in real danger economically in this country of changing the economic bond that held us together. Next slide. We have a comment from Anthony. Federalist 10 seems prescient in how it predicts that there would be a rise of those who would seek equal division of property. Yes, they were, that was my point. Skipping down though to the next paragraph, the anti-federalist argument against Madison's Federalist 10 would include the claims that eventually the individual states would cede power to the federal government and thus fall into the same circumstances as small republics. Certainly it was the states that gave us the 17th Amendment with the encouragement of the progressives. States were so ignorant of their own power, they threw it away. So certainly to that extent, you're, you're right on, I think, Anthony. In those small republics, one faction would control the levers of power and the force the individual states to yield to the federal power. And the only remaining protection would be by a Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights at the founding was not as was not important at all to the Federalists. And even the anti-Federalists, many of them thought of the Bill of Rights as one, a Bill of States' rights, and two, as hortatory. They didn't think of it necessarily as the book, what the anti-Federalists were for. They didn't think of it in libertarian terms the way so many people do today. Okay, next slide, Bob. Okay, control. A republic by which I mean a government in which the scheme of representation takes place. Okay, republic has many possible ideas and many places claim to be republics like the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics that aren't republics at all. And there are other places that are oligarchies and claim to be republics. So this is one of those words that you can fill a lot with. We'll talk about it more in Federalist 39. But it says he opens up a different prospect and promises the cure for which we are seeking. Now, the anti-federalists recognize that as a matter of necessity, you couldn't have democracy. But they looked on representation as a necessary evil, I would say. The federalists, on the other hand, are not looking at it that way. They are looking at it instead as part of the solution. The two great points of difference between democracy and republic are first the delegation of government in the latter to a small number of citizens elected to the rest. And that is what the anti-federalists worried about. Secondly, the greater number of citizens in the greater sphere of the country over which the latter may be extended. Again, what the anti-federalists were against. Now we're coming, we're not finished with Federalist 10, but we're coming close to the end of the hour. Let's look for just a minute at the next slide. So um, just quickly, manufactures tempers or sinister designs made by intrigue or corruption or by other means, first obtain the suffragan and then betray the interests of the people. The question resulting is whether small or extensive republics are most favorable to the election of the proper guardians of the public wheel. After this, that's what he's gonna talk about. We will come back to that in the next session plus Federalist 11, Federalist 15 and 23. And you may say, how are we gonna get through all of that given we couldn't get through this one? Well, none of those are as important as, as 10. And the important parts of them, which are important, the parts, we can go over much more quickly. So thank you for joining us this evening. And again, if you wanna understand more about this, go to the slide deck uh, 
send in questions if you have it, and we will meet again next week. Thank you.